Welcome to part four of this series thing. I called it a series thing before. I'm going to call it series thing again. So let's go on with that. Um, the main point of the series was really originally that Carl got to go to AWE, uh, Augmented World Expo, where a bunch of companies usually show off their more recent uh, either products or stuff they're working on related to mostly optical AR. So I'm going to give the, sh the floor to Carl Gutag to really just showcase all the things that he thought were mostly interesting or really just all the things he just got to run through at the show floor. Okay, yeah. I think in the last couple of shows, we went into depth in, in some other stuff. And, and uh, for this, this thing, I'm going to try to do a fairly quick run through of just uh, about 20, 25 booths I, I went to at the show. So let's uh, get going. Tilt 5. Tilt 5 was there again. Uh, their fame had preceded them. Uh, they won an Augie Award for Best Game Toy. Um, their booth was very, very busy, very interested. I think that was kind of their real first breakout show where they went to a little bit broader audience. And I almost would call it the oh wow, because I heard I can't you cannot believe how many people put on the glasses and they go, oh wow. I mean that's like their first reaction. So once again, it was a good thing. You've done a show about her, so let's uh Let's go on, but I thought, so Red 6 is doing these ultra wide field of view AR stuff. And they've got a couple of different designs, but this thing's gonna be like a huge field of view. I think it's over a hundred degrees. As famously no pupil swim, which is a technical term, but it's, it's solving a lot of problems. And I, I know somebody who's got a consulting company who's working with them and, and doing a great job. By the way, David Benelli, he's with uh, Pulsar. Uh, so I'd like to drop him a thing because he helps me out on the blog occasionally. So this is for pilots, it looks like, right? This is a military, yeah, like an AR, a, a pilot training. Okay. So it's all about training. It's all about teaching them. Basically, it's like instead of putting them in a dome, they're putting effectively a dome view in their helmet. So it's like a dome in a helmet. Wow. Yeah, and it's it's a pretty massive problem. And, and David's got some new, developed some new technology to put in there to do it. Do you know, like, any of the details of, like, what kind of displays or uh, optics are you They're doing a couple of things, but one of them is really neat. The display itself is actually cur physically curved, and that's part of, the, part, of, part of the magic of it. Wow. So we've already talked, I think, we talked about color link. I just brought throw them in again because it's, it's just so important, this thing called quarter wave plates. Everybody knows what polarizers are. But it's really what makes polarizers used so much is quarter wave plates because they're they're basically like an optical switch. But well, a quarter wave plate in a mirror, when it goes through a mirror, you can switch which way the polarization goes. That's why it's used in pancake optics. It's why it's used in birdbath optics, and even white tilt five uses it. Those things are everywhere. Uh, I find I'm using that term all the time these days as I start to analyze stuff. I, I like the story you told. Um, I think it was like the, the, the cupcake wrappers is what this technology like was based uh, it was on. A plastic film that was on an Edelman box. Yeah. It was a company called Philips doing L cost. And they found out they, they were, this, is bef this was like a decade or more than a decade ago. This was back like in the mid 2000s. And they apparently bought all that they had. And, and apparently, it, it's kind of by accident they had one that worked very well. But Colorlink is the company in, in Japan, yeah. and they developed these things really professionally and whatnot. Right. Uh, I'm telling you that, that we use them all over the place. They're also used for contrast improvement with LCOS. If you rotate a quarter wave plate, you can slightly shift things, and you can dial in contrast. When you're wanting really high contrast, you can put these quarter wave plates in. They're used just throughout anything dealing with polarized light. And it's also why, even though like, like you think of an OLED that's in a pancake optics, mm -hmm. that's unpolarized light. Yeah. When you put a polarizer in there, you give up about 60% of your brightness right off the bat, that first polarizer. And you might say, why do people do that? Well, it's the power of the core. It's the power that once you have polarized light, you can kind of switch it. Yeah. And you use these quarter wave plates to kind of change the polarization of light and by controlling the polarization you can make the light go different directions you know dispelx got to see them at the show they're working with everything the thing about dispelx is they're they're one of the last free wave guy companies it seems like every time you turn around somebody's being bought i mean you're seeing it and yeah. we've talked about this how companies keep getting bought out uh, i don't know why dispelx is still around 
I would say judging from their various things, their optical quality was approaching. They were probably behind wave optics. Mm -hmm. They may, at least they were gaining on them and they have some interesting things. Like if you don't need really good color quality, they can, they will work with, um, uh, they can do a single layer one. They do all three colors in one layer. If you want to go wider field of view or you need better color control, you know, like you don't like this kind of how the color kind of wiggles around as you go across the display. Then they have a three, they have a three waveguide solution. Okay. But they're working with DLP, they work with LCOS, they work with laser beam scanning, and they're working with micro LED. So that's kind of why I threw them in here. And they've been, they're getting, they're kind of getting to be a name because they're right now the only free guy. I heard some uh, griping on the floor that Wave Optics was getting to be hard to work with since mm -hmm. they were bought by Snap. The official position was that Wave Optics was still an independent company of Snap, yeah. uh, but they're apparently not as motivated. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here, whether it's a motivation or whether it's a policy. Right. Uh, I did notice that people were who were Wave, guy, uh, Wave Optics people were still using them, having some uh, issues with supply. I, I have a... Um, quick question about this and really just like these kind of things in general so when i see that a company is working with so many different display engines are they making different waveguides uh designed for different display engines or like one waveguide that could fit all usually i think they're doing it depends some of them i i would think lcos and dlp can use fairly similar stuff there because you have when you look at these things you really have to think the engine the engine's a thing as a projector yeah. and we call it an engine that's your display device and some optics around it to get the light condition to go into the waveguide one of the tricks of the waveguides they have this little teeny tiny hole you got to go into yeah. and the light has to be perfectly collimated mm -hmm. and collimated means it's at infinity too so what happens is once you perfectly collimate it the light that comes out of a waveguide, unless you do something special, um, comes out at infinity. So it's focused in infinity, and they actually have to put optics in there to move it. But anyway, the um, um, I think they're doing some formula stuff. I, th I think everyone's found that laser beam scanning has been a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. They have lots more problem with laser beam scanning. Right. Things get much more critical. There's There's kind of an interference. One of the things about laser light, it's coherent. And it interferes with itself. It's why you see speckle. You hear a lot about speckle and all. Now, I didn't see it much in the way of speckle, with, by the way, with these engines. But you do see the colors, at least, in anything I've seen so far with laser beam scanning has just been vastly worse. And we'll probably talk a little more about that. Um, you are seeing, and one of the more impressive things I saw was Avagon uh, was working with them. They've got a couple of really tiny engines. That's an actual working set of glasses with wow. a 30 degree field of view. Um, uh, I think it's only monocular in that particular headset, but uh, but it's it's actually working, and um, and you can see it looks very similar to the thing that they did there. But um, it's it's pretty impressive. The other thing that they've been working on, and the thing to note here, this was actually running when I took the picture. Mm -hmm. We'll talk a little more about that later when we get to Magic Leap. They haven't solved this yet. Yeah. But the, there's no front projection coming off. That's wow. a that's a big thing. Now, it does front project, but it actually projects downward, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, I hope. So uh, we've already talked a lot. We talked about uh, Zafar, I think, last time, mm -hmm. kind of like uh, pass-through on the very cheap. <laughs> I'm a bit concerned about the fact that the cameras aren't centered and all. They're a company, by the way, in, Lo in the London area. They're out of the UK. The Barjo? Uh, sorry, Barjo. I got to... I got to break myself of that. They're, I did that all the time, too. These days. They started out, they didn't care, but I guess they've gotten bigger now, and they want to make sure people know their name is Vario. <laughs> so, in spite of the way it's spelled. <laughs> so they had a, they had both the Aereo demo, which is their kind of high-resolution single panel. Yeah, I think that's the way things AR is going to go. And then they had their XR3, which is a pass-through with camera thing. Right. And the pass-through with cameras... They use a foveated display, but it's a what we call fixed foveated, yeah. where the display is just in the center. It works pretty well. I think what they found is you get about 90% of the benefit with a fixed display that you do if you can move it around. Yeah. And I have yet to see, I've talked to a lot of people, I've seen things, people talk about it. I've yet to see anybody move that display around. This will become important later. We're going to mention uh, Mojo Vision. 
and they have the same problem. But it's, it's incredibly complicated to track the eye with a display and make sure the eye sees it the way you think, because your eye is effectively taking a series of snapshots. And that's oversimplification, but it's a good way to think about it. And so what if you move the display when the, can when the eye was taking the snapshot and, and there is some blanking. The, by the way, this is another thing people know. The eye blanks a little bit when the eye moves, but it doesn't totally blank. And it's unclear, like, if your eye moves and you move the display, will the eye see it as motion, mm -hmm. but the display moved? Or will the eye say the display stayed in the same place because my eye moved? It gets really, really kind of, <laughs> kind of get into a, a, one of those little loops where it, you can't, don't know what will happen. So anyway... Uh, you also see there's a little, I, I circled here, there's a little difference in the compute power required for Aereo, which is meant to be more high resolution or high end consumer yeah. versus the XR3, which is very high end. I think they're what, 5,000 yeah. plus dollar headsets. And that's not including the computers. So you also have a much more powerful compute pack. They are using, they're tracking, they're using the lighthouses mm -hmm. or whatever you guys call them. Yep. Um, so anyway. That's that's the uh, that's there, there very is up. one thing I wanted to mention about the phobia display thing. Um, yeah, a lot of time, like for almost a, a year or two, um, a lot of people were saying that Apple was going to copy this setup with a micro OLED and then a larger OLED to do peripheral. I was fighting against that like on Twitter like all the time. I, I did not believe Apple was going to do that because. Um, so, you know, with these headsets, they can do that because they're pretty bulky and, you know, they have the small display uh, down pointing up and they have a mirror and all that space. Well, I didn't see Apple's making a bulky headset. I saw them they were going to use like a pancake dis uh, thing where they got to put a display like right against that thing. And then uh, it was really just a month ago that now the industry is finally changing and realizing, yeah, they're not doing the Vario thing. <laughs> well, you know, part of the problem with Apple is that and particularly for these analysts now, I was talking, I talked to a, a guy who actually, a professional guy who follows Apple. He says, you know, they, they A, know who's following them. They know a lot of the sources now. They pump out a lot of stuff. The other thing you have to figure out is they could all be right. And, and on top of this, Apple's got three or four programs going. So yeah. they could be doing things just to mess people up, or they could be doing things because they got three programs going. Mm -hmm. And so you never know whether these sources are good. Because yeah. Apple's not dumb. Right. And when these guys, and you know, I don't think I'd be poking the bear like making fun of of, of Tim Cook because that's just going to give them more incentive to screw with these guys. So, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not like they're really dumb or yeah. they're oblivious to it. So it's really kind of hard to know. It's like if you look at the companies that I think might be making money in so-called AR or XR, it's probably realware. They were a um, actually. It's actually this is a derivative of Copen. Copen originally had a program called GoldenEye. By the way, this is where I come in. I've been being around for so long. I know the history of a lot of these <laughs> things. But if you go back and dig around and look up, you'll see there's a thing called GoldenEye, and it's this boom mic thing. And actually, this is close to what I first did. Yeah. Um, as I told you, I had a bird bath optics in it, and it was this kind of thing on a boom. Now we didn't have. Like I say, the LEDs and the and the, the displays we had today, we were doing like 1024 by 768. But uh, these guys are actually doing a pass through. Copen had what they call a lift off, or a, it's a little bit like a microscopic version of an LCD. This backlit, mm -hmm. the lights in the back, so they actually take they make the transistors on silicon and flip make copy the transistors or put them on the back, uh, put them on there and shine through it and all so it's a, a little bit more like a micro miniature lcd hmm. uh, so this is really grotty old technology they've been doing this for like 15 20 years now yeah and golden eye was out there about 10 years ago they were really big with golden eye so this is like a 10 year old thing and if you look at it it's not really it's not see-through at all it's shooting into an eye but if you get down to it, I think they might be making money with this they just raised a ton yeah. they were bought out uh golden uh, GoldenEye got sold out to Realware, and I think Realware is part of a bigger thing that was bought out by a Chinese company. But anyway, but this actually might be actually selling it. You know, they, they sell these units at a profit, I think. Yeah. Uh, which, you, which if you amortize in the all R and D cost of many of the other AR companies, they couldn't say that. Yeah. Uh, but this is like 
you know, they, now the other thing that they do is a big, at least I, I remember from GoldenEye days, big on audio. Remember input. Notice how this is classic. See how the hands, you got to kind of keep your hands free. Now this guy's, you know, you, you don't have the ability uh, to, to do a lot of typing and stuff. Although this guy's got a keyboard with him. A lot of this is hands free. And a lot of this back in the GoldenEye days, they really were emphasizing the audio input stuff. Right. Because you can't really be clicking in air and doing all this stuff like you see with these AR headsets. Yeah. Um, you know, you're lucky if you can have controllers with a couple of buttons. But trying to type, anybody's tried to type by clicking in air will tell you it's horrible. And anybody tries to tell, you know, anybody tried to keep uh, type with with a mouse or a joystick or whatever is will tell you it's a pain in the ass too. So. Um, so that kind of leads me into Copen. Uh, Copen, there's that real wear, there's real wear right there. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, this is also, you can see there's more real wear. So they're doing the real wear stuff. Uh, they're also doing, of course, uh, but this was all done with Elcos. I also ran in, as I think I may have told you, there's a company called Forth that, uh, Copen bought. Well, I did the original Silicon back when that company was, the company before that was CRL Opto. Oh. And I did the actual Silicon design. And they made a deal with a company I was working with. That first one, when I went out in AR, and they got the back plane. But now that company evolved, and it's now fourth display, which does super high resolution stuff. That part part of the company, which did do the red camera display when Red had their movie cameras, mm. uh, apparently the largest part of their business is not even to do with display per se. This was like structured light and stuff. They're doing stuff to manipulate li uh, structured light for sensing and all. A uh, whole other area, which kind of shows you these displays get used in different ways. Yeah. But Copen's uh, has a product line that started with transmit these transmissive displays. They bought uh, they bought this company uh, Forth, which does high resolution field sequential color and also structure light displays. But that's done in a high speed L cost. And then they're and of course famously right now, particularly in your world, uh, they're doing these. Um, uh, large, that's that's huge. By the way, I look at that thing as the chip, and I'm like, oh my god. I, I think my biggest chip that I worked on this course over 20 years ago was probably a third or a quarter of that. <laughs> yeah, like 1.3, right? I think. Yeah, that's that's huge. <laughs> I, I think that's around. I think 1.4 is what the current machines uh, reach for now for one vertical right. shot. They they also develop the optics. They have optics design. They develop optics for the pancake. So like that uh, Panasonic, is it? I think it has been around with the pancake optics. My understanding is that's Copen Optics. You know about the Panasonic uh, headset. They've shown that off a couple years. Um, well, Panasonic threw out uh, that headset design to a subsidiary called um, Shift All. And oh, that's right. I heard that. Yeah, it kind of came out under another name. Yeah, they're, 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 people are waiting for it. Um, I got to see it at CES. So it was pretty good, but... Um... Yeah, yeah, well, it, they haven't given any news on when that product's going to actually come out. It was supposed to come out in spring, but obviously that was, I don't, I don't know how they announced something like that. Yeah, as we talked last time, I think that we're going to find there's still a gap here that, you know, they're struggling to get to 95 degrees yeah. uh, field of view when you go that, when you start with a really tiny display, it's hard. Mm -hmm. That's why they're going to all this complex pancake optics, because they got to basically magnify this thing in a very short distance. So then we have Freeforms. Twos has been around for a while. Twos is, is basically got it, they do an injection molded process where they 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 um, they mold together and they, they, they shoot these things and mold them together. So it's a, a very small Freeform. You see, uh, by the way, there's a, a line between a Freeform and a waveguide. When I say waveguide, it's extremely thin and it's making Many, many, many t total and uh, total um, internal reflected bounces. By the way, it turns out when you hit a piece of glass or or plastic uh, optical material, if the in based on the index of refraction, there's a certain angle at which all of it will re all the light will reflect. That's called total internal reflection. It's why like uh, people mostly familiar with it like fiber optics. That's the way fiber optics work. So you don't even have to put a mirror on it. You don't have to coat it or anything. The light will stay inside. Well, a lot of time, freeform optics will take a couple of bounces, two or three or four bounces. And then in their case, they use a Fresnel lens to 
uh, shoot the light out to get the light to come out because otherwise if you put a simple mirror there if this was a flat mirror it would shoot out and miss the eye so you have to do something to redirect the light out towards the eye now in the case of of um, um, uh, waveguides well they're much thinner and this thing's like either a diffraction grating or in the case of Loomis it's a set of mirrors but you've got to have something that's going to direct that light out uh, to get the light to come to stop to, st to stop TIR and you have to get it at an angle because you'll notice the light hit the same surface this is clear it won't come out because it'll TIR but when it comes here it's going to hit out at about a 90 degree angle so the so it will no longer TIR anymore. But as long as it's at this shallow angle, it's going to keep bouncing around inside the once it's in. So you generally have to have a way to get in to get it going at that angle, and then a way to get out. And there are different approaches to getting light to go in and light to come out. But anyway, theirs is an injection molded process. It works with micro OLEDs, but they were also showing at the show for the first time that I know of micro LEDs. So they're also looking at micro LEDs because they can get really bright right. and they're much more efficient. I mean, you're going to gain 10, 20 X the efficiency. Yeah. So you need very little power. If you don't need the super brightness of micro LEDs, you can, you can do there. Now they are very small eye box. You're talking, I don't know what the field of view is. It's not very big on this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you are also, you can't help. And as you know, you notice they put this a little off the line of sight. And the reason for that is this does affect your vision a little bit. If you look through this into the real world, it's enough, it's it's out of focus, but it's enough in focus that when you look at stuff in the real world, it will disturb them a little bit. So you wouldn't want to like read a book through this stuff. Yeah. Um, so you are looking through a Fresnel lens and, um, and so therefore the image can't be in the center of view. Therefore it tends to, it, it's used monocularly. That a lot of these things domino, you know. Once you do this, then you got to do this, then you got to do that, and that's kind of what happens there. But they were at the show. Um, their thing is that they can make these prescription lenses, so they, these moldings. But they have a huge upfront cost because, unlike, we'll talk a little bit about uh, um, a company called Lux XL. Mm -hmm. Unlike them. These guys are are injection molded plastic, so they have a very expensive mold, and you got to have a bunch of those to deal with all the thing, all the different uh, prescriptions and all. So it does get to be a little tricky that way. Something else we talk a lot about, and you'll kind of see here. Here's an eye box. Yeah. You kind of see how the light is going around. That light is. They have a fairly large eye box, but you see how. You have to have the eye boxes so your eye can move around a little bit or the glasses can move around so you can mm -hmm. see light. And the Gore-Tex booth was particularly interesting because Qualcomm, right before the show, made an announcement of a freeform AR reference design. Yep. And um, uh, basically, I, I, I don't know why they did it. Uh, um, freeforms have been around for a while, but when you do a freeform, you you have a very you end up with this very thick thing because what a free from does is also doing all this TIRing. It's it's um, oftentimes you have a little bit of more optics up here, but your idea is a little bit like a bird bath. The advantage over a bird bath is you don't have to look through a beam splitter. You get to you bounce you use the TIRing and you hit this curved lens and you kind of use the TIR to get it sort of on axis. There's actually maybe some lenses that aren't shown here. Usually there's a few other lenses before the micro display. Uh, but I just, I picked this up because it's, it's a good example of how it works. The problem you have is if you look through a wedge shaped piece of plastic like this, you would totally distort the real world. Mm. So you need what they call a freeform corrector, which is another big thick piece of glass that basically neutralizes. So this curve and that curve would then be the same. So what you end up with is this very thick piece of plastic. And um, as I was digging through my slides, because I, I was wondering how they were doing this optics, when you first look at it, you might think it's a bird bath. But if you look really carefully, you'll see there's a split line that kicks the light towards the eye rather than away from the eye. Right. On a bird bath, like a N-reel, the light comes down and gets kicked here and back, and the, there's a slant the other way. Well, it turned out I was just digging through slides, and sure enough, Lenovo in 2017 have what looked like almost the identical optics. And I know that Lenovo works a lot with, with Gore-Tex. 
uh, Gore-Tex is like, uh, you, you probably never heard them because you never see their name in front. Yeah. But if you're in the industry, Gore-Tex is one of the big names in, 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 in putting together optics. Absolutely. Uh, all the big boys use them. Um, I'm not even surprised if, if Apple isn't. Yeah. Um, but but many, many big name companies. Gore-Tex like a big name in the optics area when you get to assembly in China. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so they... Um, so I have a feeling this is kind of like an off-the-shelf thing that Gore-Tex had that got repurposed into here. Because this Lenovo headset, as far as I know, never went to market. Yeah, I don't think uh, so. It's, it's been replaced by a bird. Ironically, interestingly enough, it was replaced by a bird bath that's optically very much is better than. Actually, it's, it goes back to the ODG R9. Some of the people working on the uh, Lenovo headset uh, used to work for ODG. And they're doing a, 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 it's a better version than the, than the Enreal. It's got some better optics in it, but it's similar in capability and mm-hmm. similar in design because basically uh, Enreal was really copying the ODG R9. Right. Uh, I don't know if they even make a secret of that, but that was basically their model. By the way, those patents were bought by a little company called Magic Leap, <laughs> who then had to, who have then since, Taken those patents and mortgaged them, and I think they're now held by Bank of America. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, so so you got to try those glasses though. Um, like, what what kind of demo were they showing? Not much, just yeah. a movie loop. Um, I think I've told you before. Um, I can, I almost given up taking photos. I've only got a few photos from the show floor because if I can't control the content, you can't see anything. Yeah. As I think I told you, if I can control the demo, I can hide everything. Right, right. And they were just showing like a movie loop. Yeah. It looked okay, but it was an OLED. You know, you got an, this is an OLED display, so the display itself was good. They were showing kind of a bright movie content, which mm-hmm. means I couldn't tell you if they had reflections. You know, you couldn't really tell much from them. What about you can't the... tell the block. What's that? What about like the see-through? You're saying like these kind of optics make it hard to see the outside yeah, world. Yeah, you get a little bit of that. I mean, yeah. it's you're looking through a very thick piece of glass. So if you mm. think about it, that thing is so thick. It's a little bit like I sometimes talk about the aquarium view. If you ever been in an aquarium, you kind of look. They have a really big, thick piece of plastic or glass to keep the water in. Yeah, you kind of get this thick piece. You're looking at different depths through it. It's not bad. It wasn't as bad as I thought it might be. Right. But you got to realize you are looking through a very thick piece of glass, and mm-hmm. so you get kind of a swim or a, a, a effect. I don't think this is a serious design, frankly. I think it's something that's there as a reference design and let some, you know, just so you have something you can give to a developer. Right. This is kind of a thing I've seen, you know. I'm, I'm a little more used to Apple that says, hey, we're going to build a product, and usually six within six months, there's a product shipping in millions, okay? We've got this new wave thing, which is, oh, we're going to do a uh, an evaluation system or a developer system. Yeah. I don't many good developers now maybe they'll do it for apple but not many people are going to develop for something that doesn't exist doesn't have a big name who's going to put as a product Mm -hmm. if you're a developer you want a multi-million unit base you're writing software or something so anyway we'll see it's micro oled and as their name of the company suggests they're working on micro oleds uh they're kind of the guy you see in a lot of i call low resolution high brightness units they do a lot of stuff that has one color. It's a kind of a yellow, which is shows up really well in, in daylight. And they've got several, they've got tens of thousands, they do like over 10,000 nits. And if you combine that with a fairly low loss thing, they're basically doing an off axis. Uh, they have a funky mechanism where they have a mirror, the display goes bing, 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 and <laughs> mirrors out to a curved lens that kind of acts as your curved lens. So this is a little bit of a, a free form thing. And these two displays, I believe, are nominally the same resolution, although I think this one, the bigger one here, is a red and they do some stuff where they do just red and yellow. Yeah. And it may seem crazy, but if all you're doing is real low resolution content, red means bad, red is good for warning, yellow means, hey, that's what's going on. Right. And, and um, you can argue, I mean, I did heads up displays, and you really, if, if you're going to do colors, you have to do really bright, solid colors you can't you can't do subtle stuff because 
you've got so much other competing um, light out there. So anyway, but they're nice and tiny, and they've got this really tiny engine they've got in these glasses. They're kind of aiming at the sports market, like where you're wearing these things as you know, like bicycling and uh, running and athletics. So they're uh, maybe, and you might do this in like a ski goggle or something. So they're they're kind of aiming, but it's really low detail content information. You know, numbers or arrows and stuff. Right. Not not a, you know, maybe your heart rate. That's big. That's big in this thing. Like your speed and your velocity and heart rate kind of stuff. Right. It looks okay. It's a tiny image. The eye box is kind of small. Yeah. Um, it's it, it you know you turn a small eye box into a feature and you say well then it doesn't get in your way when you're doing stuff. It's it's okay. I mean it works. Yeah. Um, I think the bigger issue is is there much of a market for it? I've heard right. bicyclists go both ways. I mean, you know, your your content is less than you get on a on a smartwatch. Yeah. So there's a lot of people who just say, well, I'll just look down at my smartwatch if I need to get that a little bit. I mean, this puts it in front of you, it's eyes in front of you, but it the bigger question is, is there a big market yeah. for it? They are geeky looking when you look at them from the front, unless you wear like sunglasses, because you have this big black, I mean, you do have a, it does, while it may look like glasses a little bit, particularly they like to show them like in a sunglass mode, mm -hmm. like this guy's wearing them as a sunglass. Well, the sunglasses are partly there to hide all the geekiness of yeah. it. It's because a lot of times these are being used outdoors. So there's a real reason for that. This is rather funny. You know, we talk about Meta. Well, you know where they got the name from was a company called, uh, there, was a, there was a company called Meta uh, that did the Meta 1 and the Meta 2. Well, Meta, Meta went bankrupt. Mm. And what happened is the, the, um, uh, this company, Campfire, uh, bought their bought all the assets of the company. They bought the technology <laughs> and all the assets and formed Campfire, kind of reborn. But they didn't buy the name. Right. There was another company called Facebook. You may have heard of. Bought the name. Yeah. So uh, they have everything but the name. So they rebranded themselves, but then they changed their name to Campfire since they did since the name was sold. Um, and they they have a system with a. They have this thing. It's kind of like a lighthouse, but it's basically a thing that goes on the desktop. They use effectively a smartphone to be the controller, and then they have the headset. This is what I call a large. Uh, it's a very simple optics. It takes. It takes. You have a big display, about a cell phone size display up here. That takes one bounce off the mirror and into your eyes. You know, um, there are pros and cons to that approach. I mean, it's not a uh, simple thing, and. I think Meta got themselves in trouble and said, oh, I'd use this as a computer monitor. And I'm like, oh, you're crazy. <laughs> you're never going to want to use this as, a com as your computer monitor. But it does do some interesting things. It's a fairly, uh, for what it is, but it's, it's basically for a tabletop-y kind of thing. Arguably a little bit like you would do with, um, you, you might do with um, a Tilt 5, only this would be a little different, really better full color stuff. Yeah. But it gives you basically 3D visualization on like a tabletop. That's kind of what you're set up with with this kind of locator. I did not see this at the show. I've had several private demos of it over the last three or four years. So I did, I, you know, when I go to these shows, some of these booths I didn't spend a lot of time in. And I'm actually going to show you prior stuff because I, I've seen them before and I didn't think there was anything new. Uh, and I didn't have time for a private showing. Same with Vario. I'd seen it a few times. I'd had a really good private demos with it before. I've done stuff on my blog, uh, showing pictures through it and all. So um, I, I, I will spend time on things I haven't seen. The one thing I'm curious, so you've tried this headset before, basically? Yes, several times. Was it comfortable with the, like, it looks like it's putting pressure on both the forehead and the back of the, the head. What, what do you think about yeah, that? I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't remember any real problem with that. I wore it for quite a while. Um, I think it was fine. I think they've got, I mean, that's why you have such large support areas. There's tricks you can do. Um, you know, the thing that they're not doing, you notice, is putting it on the nose and the ears. That's where you do not want to support things. Yeah. They, ha they have fairly, I don't remember it being at all uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and, and they probably strategically placed these things. And they're nice big pads, so I would think they wouldn't have much trouble. That now, you know, one thing is, these people don't give a rat about your hair. Yeah. You know, you know, in, in this day and age of, you know, uh, where we we have a lot of women in the workplace, 
a lot, a lot of them are going to wear a lot more hair, and if they do have hair, it, it sits up more. Even <laughs> even if it's long hair with a man, um, it sits up a bit more. So you kind of don't worry about hair when you do mm-hmm. <laughs> when you do, uh, do this kind of stuff. The only reason so, I, I point out is because um, this is this is the exact head strap design that uh, Meta is doing with Cambria. Same like on the forehead and on the back. Um, so it's just, it's just fun to see it on another device. I have a joke. It'd be a lot simpler if people would let us put bolts on their head. You know, we just you know drill into your skull, put a few <laughs> bolts, a few few mounting points up there. It'd be so much easier. Uh, the bat. The thing you don't really want to put much weight on is the nose and the ears because yeah. it's cartilage. There's just they can't take hardly any weight. Right. So um, just say here, yeah, this is Meta Two. Oh. So I'm just showing you here how Meta Two became Campfire. You can see it's much better styled and whatnot, but this kind of shows how it works. So I had a good view of this. So you see it comes down, hits. This is actually a semi-mirror. It's a, now you just decide based on how transparent you want it. Typically, these are like 50-50-ish. They're in that 50%, 50% light through, 50% bad. And that's about what this looks like. So you have about a 50-50 mirror. So about half the light of the display ends up going back to your eye. It's a pretty simple mirror thing. The problem with this approach is well known. By the way, there's another company that was there called Eyeglass AR. Um, I run this guy. He's a big fan of the blog. He always likes to, he's a friendly guy, always has. And what you get is a pretty good image, but it's going to be distorted. You know, we talk about why do people go with this beam splitter and doing Nreal? Yeah. Well, it's because they want to be on axis. They want the light to hit uh, t- uh, perpendicular to the curvature of that mirror. If you don't, you get this problem. You see, this is a picture I took through here of a football field. It was a perfect video demo for this. Um, and I, I want to point this out. This is not, the camera focuses at one point. If, you, if, the, if I focus down here, this would also be in focus. The problem is this is focused at a different point in space than the d- bottom of the screen. So what's happening is, as you're at the top, you have a shorter distance for light to travel. That shorter distance will mean that the magnification will be less. So you get this, you get a linear distortion. And then because it also, it's getting magnified a different amount, it's also gonna change the focus a different amount. So what's happening down here is you're getting more magnification. The farther away you get, the lower down you get, you get more magnification and you get more focus change. So the focus is different. Now, you could argue if your eye is kind of moving around that you're, you, you get what I call a tilted focus plane, but as your eye's moving around, the eye will keep adapting to this. But it's, it's kind of like, you kind of feel like the play field's tilted. And what they, now what's not been done here, which is fortunate in this simple demo, guys will say, well, I can fix that. Well, yeah, you can straighten out these lines. When you straighten out those lines to make it not be curved like that, when you do that, you lose resolution. You can't. You can't beat. We call Nyquist. You. 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 When you try to do that, you're going to take one pixel and kind of blend it over several pixels, and it's a softening. And so you can make these lines look straight, but you're going to lose resolution when you do that. What if you also um, super sampled the image though at the same time? Would that be a you you have to super you have to have a higher resolution display. Yeah. You, you can do whatever you want to the original image. Mm-hmm. Um, and that would be help if you don't go two steps. Now, mm-hmm. now, what is better from a technical standpoint? Let's say I had a 3D rotating whatever. It'd be much re- better to process the image onto the grid that exists. Same problem we have in laser beam scanning. Scan lines are not the same because on laser beam scanning, they never hit the pixel. No, no, no scan line is equal to hits any pixel. Right. It's always between pixels. So they're always having to resample. Normally, by the way, when you resample, normally you go typically at least about nine pixels. You get the pixel because you're going to have four. The 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 optimum point runs usually lands between four pixels of the grid, and then you've got to then do a little bit around that. And when you're all done, you tick about nine or to twelve pixels. So that's why you're actually blurring that one pixel over about nine pick nine to twelve pixels when you do it. Now it's it. You know, it 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 works, but it, it but I'm saying you tend to effectively lose about half the resolution each way when you do it, right? Um, because 
you, you're, you're hitting in between. Um, and no amount of sharpening will, will take that out. However, that's still better if you had an initial object, like a 3D spaced object, and you had that super resolution to begin with, it will be better than two stage, where you first go onto the grid and then take the grid and go onto there. You'd be better off to go in one step to the grid, but you're still down to trying to to hit the various things. But yes, right. it would be better if you did it in in one step versus a two stage. Most people don't do that. But anyway, the other thing, but the thing you can never fix is focus. Yeah. This deal that the focus changes, you can't fix that digitally. You have to fix that optically. And that's why the optics gets to be so important. You just can't change focus. Nothing you can do digitally can change the focusing aspect. Um, I also want to mention, this is just an, an aside, but it's one of my, you know, it goes back to the thing I said that real wear, mm -hmm. and I think this is kind of a message of me, focus on the markets. That, if you, look at your technology. Technologies, the AR technology will let us do things. I'm not trying... I sometimes come off that everything is terrible, but actually there are some applications that make sense. Yeah. But you kind of got to dig and you can't just, this whole thing of replace the cell phone is where I, I cringe. Um, but anyway, there's a company called Mira. And um, uh, they've been on, I've talked about them on my blog, but Mira is being used and got, got their thing. It's the same kind of thing. It's a display and whatnot. And they got designed into Mario Kart ride in Universal Studios Japan. I think it's coming to California yep. and Florida. Yep. Uh, that that ride system. And what's magical about it? I don't know if I put the other slide in. Hang on a sec. Oh, I did put it in because oh, nice. I wanted to show this. What what ended up being important here is a couple of things. Yeah, they're gonna. Have, by the way, they have all this problem. The same problem that yeah. doesn't go away with them. They got the same problem there. But uh, and this is something I, I visited their actual, I was happened to be in California. I visited them back in 2017, one of the earlier models. Shows you how long it takes to go. That was five years ago now. Yeah. Um, and this is just showing it from a YouTube video, showing that the display, you can see the display. What they're doing is they're augmenting stuff. So there's stuff in the real world and they want to put stuff up in front of you that you see. But what really I think makes the technology interesting, particularly, particularly in, the, in the era of COVID, is what they have is they had a, a they were they're so cheap and light and everything, and they did it here. They had this magnetic their visor fit on. What's kind of neat with them is they kind of have a three part affair, where they have the they have a headband that you put on while you're in line. Okay, and this I think is kind of interesting how it, it's kind of ingenious. I don't know who did this, whether it was them. It's probably Universal thought this up. But it was because it was so simple they could do this. Yeah. Also, you notice they have so much eye relief. Look at my glasses. I got like inches from my glasses. So you got huge eye relief. You don't have to worry about prescriptions. We're thinking about theme park. We got everybody in the world, all different faces, shapes. What's neat is you put this thing on while you're in line and you put the headband on. There's no expensive, because the expensive part, it, the two most expensive, the far and the most expensive things to compute pack, mm -hmm. which probably has to be charged up. It's probably wireless. Yeah. So you have this. So you have this compute pack, which is kind of like a cell phone. Uh, you can charge it up separately. The guys in line, you put this on because you don't want people standing in line wearing optics and stuff. They will yeah. trip over stuff and all. Plus the the optical element is not. It's pretty cheap. These probably cost a buck to shoot, maybe. Mm -hmm. But you still don't want them getting all scratched up and all, and you may want to sanitize it. So now you got this thing. You can throw this thing in a sanitizer. You have the shield that you can throw in a, sh you know, wash and whatnot. And the compute element you could just wipe down and all. The expensive part. But they put the shield on, or the 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 optic in the front, and the um, and the uh, display. All get put in at the last instant, just as you get in the car, because the part that individually fit it to the person is that one piece of plastic that's very durable, not going to get damaged and all. So it's really kind of neat how they adapted it yeah. to make it work. So I wanted to point that out. They weren't at the show, but it kind of, I just, it's one of my kind of fun things showing how things work. No, that's, I, I think that's just, a, I, I would have never thought of it different ways that they could bring something like this to a theme park ride like that. It's, it really feels ingenious, like all the steps they took. Yeah, now they're not going to sell. Now the problem you have, how many theme park? What do they maybe have? <laughs> uh, 
you know, they probably have 10,000 per theme park. So yeah. this is probably, you know, how many of these do you need? Yeah. Uh, so it's not that many of them. The problem you have is that, once again, as I talked about the enterprise market, mm-hmm. it's probably two or 300,000 units a year. Yeah. Okay, this is a, the problem here, though, okay, it's, it's 10,000, the first theme park, per year after 10 years, maybe it's only, you know, replace a couple of thousand a year or 3,000, mm-hmm. let's say you replace a third of them a year. That's still only 3,000 units times three theme parks. Okay, you're maybe at 10,000 for worldwide. That's yeah. your worldwide sell into this, unless you get more rides going. Um, I don't know how this has worked out, but it's doing well enough that I know they're bringing it to California, and I'm pretty sure they're bringing it to Florida. Yeah. So, so it's doing well there, but it's still only like as a company, 10,000 units. If you're a little tiny company, you know, this might be a big enough deal for you. Yeah. But it, it may not, it's not going to float the boat of Zuckerberg and, and yeah, Tim for Cook. Sure. But the, yeah, there's just all kinds of things that work. By the way, it has a great eye relief, has a huge eye box. There's almost, you know, the eye box is forever. So it's just really easy. Yeah. You know, it's unlike, you're not trying to look, you, you, there's no fitting session. This has to go click, click, click in it. So it's a combination of optics, the way they work, and the way it mechanically all can be pieced together and broken down. So bird bath of plenty. I, I sometimes call it yet another bird bath. <laughs> uh, but um, one thing I like to talk about here is new eyes. Uh, really like them. That they were guaranteed a shot. I tell you what, it pays to dry, dress somebody up kooky. Uh, this guy, I forget what he used to work for, but he on his last day he wore a kilt, <laughs> and so he's uh, he keeps doing it. So you are guaranteed to get the booth shot if you do that, right? Yeah, <laughs> kooky, and you're guaranteed to get a picture in. So um, they're working. They started as a low vision company, so they have this new us new assist or whatever, but they were doing a new vision. And they're basically doing pass-through AR with this. Now, I, I know another guy, there's an old friend of mine, a guy who worked at that very first company who's also doing low vision assist. He's, ta- he's got a different approach. I would think for low vision, I kind of like his approach better, but that's just me. I don't, I'm not working in that field, but it feels better to me. Because uh, I think there's still some issues here from a pass-through AR point of view. They have a, I don't know if they have multiple cameras or a single, oh, they have multiple cameras in that one, I think. But then they, they've got to go through a phone. The phone does all the processing. Right. And that's going to create a little delay in there. So I don't know that I – there's things I know this other guy's doing that are addressing that seem to make more sense to me from a AR professional point of view. But, um, uh, but still, they started out there, but what they've done is expanded rapidly. Uh, while this is what their initial core – their initial technology, they did a couple of things. They did a pro-E – the birdbath. So they, they're starting to bring this out for enterprise and medical use. So now they're going more see-through. So the first one, they just blacked it out and do pass-through AR because with people with low vision, they, they don't have a mac, the macular, the high vision part of the lens is done. So what you have to do is you have to magnify the world and you have to increase the contrast because that part of your eye, imagine if you, all you have is your peripheral vision. You basically have to move the high resolution vision, high resolution information to a low resolution part of the eye. So what you do is you blow it up, you saturate the colors, you improve the contrast. And it turns out um, oftentimes simple stuff is the best. You can get really fancy with it, but that's not what these people generally need. They need a, um, they, 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 it's, they're older, oftentimes they're older people. They, they just need things that, that work kind of intuitively. And these people are very, I mean, you see people cry who, who get this kind of stuff because it is so, you know, lets them function again. And yeah. as I sometimes say, if you can't see and somebody offers you something, you don't care what it looks like when you're wearing it. True. Yeah. You know, if it's going to help you see, the cost is a little less of an issue and the image quality. Anyway, they branched out. They got it there. They've got a solution. It's a birdbath design. So this is a birdbath that's blocked out. Uh, they then came up with a a design that has um, uh, that does see through. I think they were doing some gaming stuff. I didn't talk about it here at the show, but I think I remember hearing they were doing some of that. But it's basically very similar to an ODG R9 or the um, A3 from Lenovo, you know, um, Unreal. Uh, but they're doing that. The other thing that they're doing that's kind of interesting. There's a company called Dolphin Ultrasound. 
and they're using their Pro E3 as an AR display with this portable uh, unit. So they combined a ultrasound unit. There's some gel in there, and a and a, it's actually a cell phone. And now you have a portable ultrasound unit, and you can look at the ultrasound while you're working the. You can be working the the uh, working the the portable um, ultrasound transducer thing, and and while you see what's going on in the headset, so that's kind of neat. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, as I said, there's so many bird dads out there. I've already talked a little bit about uh, Lenovo Think Reality. I did not spend any time in the booth this time. I had a really good demo at the last AWE. Um, I know some of the people, the company, their former ODG R9 people. Uh, that guy I talked about with Pulsar doing the Red Six, that Red Six the head helmet. He was former ODG art. He worked on the um, at an Austin House Design Group as well. So those guys have kind of split up and and gone to the world and and gone to other companies. There's at least a couple of people I know of that worked on the ODG R9, and a lot of people, you know, kind of look at this one as a reforming. Mm -hmm. It's certainly a better, much better quality. They they've improved things over Enreal. Uh, but in the end, it's still a birdbath. And the yeah. problem with a birdbath is no matter what you do, your transmissivity is going to be around 20 to 25%. So you're blocking 75% of the real world light. The image quality is always quite good because it's an, with these, with being on axis, you don't have that distortion. Right. These mirrors are cheap. The reason why people use mirrors, by the way, they're cheap to make really high quality. There's no chroma breakup. There's no color. You know, when you go through glass or a lens or plastic, the colors separate because of index of refraction for the wavelengths are different. Well, you don't get any of that with a mirror. Mirror's perfect. It, it comes, and you can do things with mirrors. You can make them a little, you can do weird things with mirrors, like make them kind of a little non-spherical, non, uh, and you can do things and not break up the colors once again. You start doing any of that kind of stuff with a lens, and you do it. A lot of times they're used in cooperation to get exactly what you want. There'll be just a little bit of refractory or you know see-through uh, transparent optics um, hitting that mirror first. But uh, anyway, so they've got a product that's much more complete. You know, Lenovo is a big company behind it, so they're doing AR. I think for industrial use. Yeah. Um, you know, when we I say it's only 25% see-through, the best. 2025. That's the same as the Magic Leap 2 just mm -hmm. announced. Um, uh, HoloLens is only about 40% see-through. Um, it, it's it's blocked 60% of the real-world light. Uh, so while it's not great, it's certainly not as bad as, bad as uh, something. So anyway, fun one. This one's kind of... Uh, they've, I, I saw them at CES a couple of years ago. I guess the last CES existed, which is 2020. Um, and it looked pretty not not that great. Uh, you may know this test pattern. This guy's obviously a fan of my blog. This test pattern he got from my blog. He took it and edited it because it wasn't high enough resolution for him. But it's kind of neat. It's a 120 degree AR, and he sometimes he promotes this as being an alternative to pancake. Um, it's it's kind of what I call dual birdbath-like. It's not quite on axis, as we'll see in the image. The image will tell you that. But it, he takes two displays coming from different sides. It does a couple of bounces, a couple of TIR bounces, and then it hits a curved mirror, which is your birdbath-like, bird but he hits it from two different displays, and he's getting about a 120-degree field of view with see-through. Now it's very much like a bird bath. You're looking through. You're looking through stuff that is polar. That that so you've got a lot of the same drawbacks you do. Um, it's you know you can see it's kind of moderately dark. It's probably I don't remember the spec, but I'm guessing it's about 25% see through. It's about 75% light blocking. You can kind of see here. You see how dark. You kind of, what happens by the way. Here's what happens too. When you when you darken something. Well, remember that that's also the only way with something like this for light to get to your face or your eye is to come through this. So actually, the if you're 25% light blocking, your face is now now only 12% of the light is making it to your face. So your eye area gets really dark, right? Um, except for where the um, display is illuminating it. So you then get this kind of weird effect of the display illuminating the some level of the area, and then it's really dark elsewhere. So it's socially not great. But 
this guy is, this is getting you, you know, 120 degree field of view and see through. It does work, um, not perfect, but it, it does work. It's kind of, I think, kind of innovative. This is a, the company it lists themselves as being out of Redmond, Washington, but I think they're, because I remember them, I think they're either a division or some relation to the mother company, which is out of China. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a fairly innovative design and, and works better than you would think. Uh, this is an actual picture taken with my cell phone, and actually the the um, the CEO there helped me take this picture. Um, and I I don't think I put in. Let me see something here. Yeah, I'll show that in a sec. But the um, you see here that this has. By the way, you look at this picture. I mean, it looks pretty good considering it's 120 degree field of view. Now, what you can see here very carefully is there's no way to be perfect. Now, the cell phone may be picking up this slit differently than your eye. Yeah, a cell phone's not the same as the eye. I tried taking some pictures with my camera. It was just too difficult on the show floor. I'd need to have all the equipment and really position it and everything, so I couldn't do it. So the cell phone was the way to go for this picture. But it, it the cell phone has such a small sensor and such a, a small aperture that it tends to accentuate pro some problems like this. But there is a split. When you get it if you move the eye up and down you can kind of see the split it, it's just you're not perfect it, but it's not as bad as you not as bad as you think looking at that optics diagram let's put it that way now you can now this is actually once again just like we talked about with the off-axis one this is slightly off-axis mm -hmm. you'll notice it's really nice and sharp in here but the but this falls off this, the focus plane is dished okay and he sh he sh could show that he actually he um yeah you see how now it's focused look over here on the side he 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 changed the point at what the place where it focused and you see here see how now this is in focus because he focused it over here right this is one of the ways you can prove it with a camera it's kind of hard to tell with your eye but if you go back to a foveated display, a lot of times what you're really after is a really sharp image in the center. Now this will have a fairly sharp image where we look. So you could kind of argue, it, if you want to play some marketing games, you could say it's more or less optically foveated. Remember, I think I've heard people use that term before, optically foveated. What they're really meaning is it's focused, you know, the, the, the focus plane is dished. But anyway, it's, it's kind of neat. It does do 120 degree field of view much better it was much improved over what it was at cef a couple of years ago um so it's it's just kind of kind of interesting in its own category um now it is two displays you're paying to get the you know two displays more complicated optics but it it worked better than i than i would have thought rokid has been around for quite a while um they have a couple of products that i know that i that i saw in the booth one was they have their bird bath. Everybody's got a bird bath. There must be at least 20 companies doing bird baths. Um, basically, I, I like to say that Enreal copied the ODG R9, and then everybody copied Enreal. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be the genesis of it. Yeah. And so they, they've, they're just bird baths crazy. You can also do bird baths with other technologies, but the favored now is OLEDs. I think there's at least one or two brand, uh, OLEDs coming out of China now, mm -hmm. and that's really accelerated the use of bird bath because yeah. Sony used to, it used to be everybody used Sony, and I know the first couple of generations at least of Enreal used Sony OLEDs. I tore them down. I got it, by the way, in case anybody's interested, I have a teardown of the Enreal on my blog. Um, but um, uh, anyway, so they got a bird bath. Their other product is a, this is a wave optics. This is like, if you wanted to get a, you know, you can, you know, if you want to get an early look, there's actually quite a few wave optics out there. I actually have a wave, a wave optics development kit using DLP. So this is a wave, this is a wave optics with a big shield around. 